I will call this meeting to order for April 12th, 2022. Let's have a roll call. Great. Fredson? Here. Sterner? Here. I'm acknowledging I do not see Council Member Vento yet, but I will watch for her to show up. Wolf? Here. Zarin? Present. Dan Lindstrom. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, hopefully, knock on wood for the last time, I will read the chair's statement, which is that the Met Council chair has determined it is not practical or prudent to conduct in person meetings in response to the COVID 19 pandemic. Accordingly, committee members will participate in this meeting via telephone or interactive technology, and the meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statutes Section 13D.021. We encourage you to monitor the, this meeting remotely, and if you have any comments, we encourage members of the public to email us at public.info at metc.state.mn.us. And with that, uh, we have an agenda today, just one item on the non-consent business uh, agenda. And so without objection, we'll move forward. We do have some minutes from March 22nd, 2022 to approve. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? I'd make a motion to approve the minutes. This is Turner. Wolf second. seconds. Thank you. Roll call. Edson. Aye. Sterner. Aye. And acknowledging Vento has joined the meeting. Aye. Thank you. Wolf. Aye. Zarin. Aye. And Lindstrom. I'll abstain since I think that's the one that I miss. And I want to thank uh, Chair Wolf for stepping in at the very last second to uh, run the show. Appreciate that. And that uh, takes us to our one non consent. Uh, we don't have any consent items today. So our one non consent business item is water supply technical analysis and outreach for engineering services. We have a master contract before us. Okay. And Mr. Davis. Yeah. Mr. Chair, thank you very much for uh, having us today. Uh, I will just introduce Brian and the topic for us today. Um, we in the mass in in the water supply planning unit because we are only four staff members, and and we are dealing with uh, with all the regional and and the mandates that we received from the legislature to carry out uh, planning uh, activities in the region. Um, it was very important for us to have support and help from consultants, uh, and we have been doing this over the last uh, uh, seven, eight years or nine years. And this is the third round of uh, master contracts that we hire contractors and we have them. And uh, we, uh, as we receive uh, requests from the communities for technical support, uh, that's when we start uh, hiring, uh, giving them some of the work uh, that they will do and perform for us. So they they become very uh, essential part of the job that we do because we are only again as I mentioned only four staff members, and it also it was a very good uh, mechanism to uh, to because we are receiving most of our funding to do technical support from the state through the clean water fund, and usually clean water fund will give us a very short period of time to use the money. And most of the time, our staff will not be able only uh, to, to do all the work that's requested by the communities for us and to, to fulfill also our, 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 uh, our commitment to the Clean Water Fund. So that, therefore, this is very important uh, for the success of the water supply planning to have consultants uh, in our, uh, uh, you know, working with consultants is very important for us to finish uh, all the required work that uh, requested for us to meet our legislative mandates. With that, I will introduce Brian Davis, a principal engineer with water supply planning. All right, thank you, Ali. Um, and I'm pleased to be here to present this business item to you today. 
on water supply technical analysis and outreach for engineering services, master contract 21P230. Next slide. So in water supply planning, we conduct our activities under Minnesota statutes 473.1565. Uh, and this encompasses our water supply planning activities in our unit, as well as the advisory committees that advise us on, on what to do in our activities. Uh, there are a number of aspects to this work. We do a lot of uh, collating, creating, and distributing of technical information on water supply, of course. And we apply that to the planning activities of the Metropolitan Council and the communities uh, and the state agencies in the metro area. We give recommendations and we receive recommendations for this work. Uh, we also are advised by advisory committees, including uh, MOSAC, the Metropolitan Area Water Supply Advisory Committee, and the Technical Advisory Committee, uh, which meet regularly. And of course, we produce a number of reports on the work that we do for the community and for, um, for the legislature. Next slide. So we have a number of guiding documents and stakeholders that affect what we do um, and influence the things that we do in these projects with engineering firms. Of course, the Thrive MSP 2040 plan is very important to us as a guiding document, as is the Water Resources Policy Plan and the master water supply plan. Uh, that latter report is one that our unit creates. And of course, then we have the two advisory committees committees that I mentioned earlier uh, that regularly meet and advise us on uh, our path forward. Next slide. So collaboration truly is, is key for, for us to be successful in the work that we do. Uh, we collaborate with experts both within the Metropolitan Council and from communities uh, that, that are in our region and also with engineers and scientists with consulting firms that we work with, um, which is what this particular uh, business item is about. We conduct technical analyses on a number of different items in water supply planning uh, that can include anything from um, well field analysis to water chemistry and contaminants in groundwater uh, to surface water groundwater interactions water reuse uh, chloride impacts on groundwater resources uh, and many other things so that that is really a, the investigative part of our work uh, then we work with stakeholders in the area in communities uh, and within the council uh, to plan to use these things that we have found uh, to influence our regional and local planning efforts. And in those planning efforts, um, we then move to an implementation phase where we fund and implement projects and build partnerships with the communities and with uh, the engineers and scientists that help us to do this work. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. Our funding comes from the legislature through the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment. Uh, this most recent special session of the legislature provides us with funding for the activities that we're talking about today. Uh, the language is shown below. This is for projects that address emerging threats to drinking water supply that provide cost-effective regional solutions that leverage interjurisdictional coordination support local implementation of water supply reliability projects and prevent degradation of groundwater resources in the metropolitan area. Next slide. So in this uh, proposal that we uh, sent out last year for services, we named a number of different categories of work that we wanted the respondents to uh, describe their abilities to do for us. And that includes things like water demand projections for communities. That has everything to do with growth in different communities, how many people will be arriving in these communities over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years and what the water demand will be as a result. Water quality and treatment studies. Uh, this of course has probably the most um, close connection right now with things related to PFAS in the East Metro in groundwater. Water supply system and infrastructure resiliency studies, and this could include things 
such as looking at the effect of efficiency on the need for future future capital investments in water supply, um, uh, things such as wells and treatment treatment plants and distribution systems and storage water rate studies. So keeping track of what water rates are doing across the metro area and also an increasingly important public outreach. So this is you know getting the word out collaboratively on the things that we're doing in these projects. Um, that's something that we're doing more and more of these days uh, through not only through, um, you know, through reports, obviously, but through meetings and social media and things like that. So that was a specific ask in this RFP was uh, an emphasis on outreach and collaboration and technologies for that. Next slide. So example deliverables under this contract could include things such as guides and tools. Uh, an example being the stormwater reuse guide, which is a project I worked on uh, a number of years ago on uh, how to conduct a stormwater reuse system, planning for it. Informational materials and graphics, short videos and social media campaigns, which I think will be a, a real emphasis this time around on what we're doing. Engagement plans for stakeholder collaboration. Online uh, or mobile applications for water efficiency actions. I think there's a real opportunity for that, especially with our work uh, with the University of Minnesota and MINTAP, the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program on our um, very successful water efficiency projects that we've been doing. Community training workshops. Uh, this is, of course, the outreach component and reports. We always have reports that, that we create that describe what we did. Um, and that's gonna continue to be uh, an aspect of what we do. Next slide. So we have uh, a number of committees and work groups that we work with and that help us to hone these projects, give us ideas for how to spend the money that we get from the legislature. You can see here on the maps, uh, the communities that are represented in these groups. So on the left side, we see the communities uh, that have representation through the Metropolitan Area Water Supply Advisory Committee or MOSAC. And then with the hatched area that's either blue or green hatched, we have communities that have a representative um, on the Technical Advisory Committee uh, or TAC. And then on the right hand side, you can see communities that are in our sub regional water supply work groups. We have a number of those work groups in the West Metro, Southwest, and Southeast Metro, uh, in the Northwest Metro, and then of course in the North and East in the groundwater management area um, that the DNR created a number of years ago around Wiper Lake. So those communities uh, and those work groups uh, are, are ones that we are you know, in close connection with and talk about our projects and work with them to create projects that are useful. Next slide. So we conducted an evaluation of the proposals that we received from a number of, of proposers. The panel consisted of council staff and also an external technical advisor uh, from Minneapolis Waterworks in this case. And we evaluated the proposals on four criteria, the quality of the proposal, the qualifications of the proposer, their experience and the price uh, that they were offering for the work. Next slide. There is also an MCUB goal in this proposal uh, the Office of Equal Opportunity assigned a Metropolitan Council underutilized business program goal of 8% for this project. Um, OEO has determined that the recommended proposer, proposers have met the Council's MCUB contract requirements for this project. Um, and we do have somebody uh, on the, uh, in the crowd today who is from um, procurement who can answer questions about that. Next slide. So the proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council authorized the regional administrator to negotiate and execute master contracts 21P, 230A, uh, in the amount of $266,666 with bar engineering, 21P, 230B, in the amount of $200,666 with HDR incorporated, and 21P, 230C, in the amount of $200,600 666, wow, and I did not, that's, I've never given a presentation with those kind of numbers before, with Kimberly Horn 
Incorporated to provide engineering support for water supply planning for a total not to exceed the procurement value of $800,000. So we have a split three ways of an even number. So as you know, we could have gone beyond the decimal point at infinitum, but we didn't do that, cut it off. So uh, I would be happy to take questions uh, at this time about the presentation. I'm glad I'm not the only one that occasionally gets tripped up with these numbers that are like nine uh, uh, numbers long. Uh, that happens to me all the time. Um, any questions? Chair Lindstrom, uh, Council Member Sterner has his hand raised. Go ahead, Council Member. All right, thank you, Chair. And, um, my question has to do with uh, like in the past, how do these numbers compare to what the past contracts have been like? And then typically we're maximizing at 800,000. Is there sometimes where we don't use it all and, and you have something to carry over for future uh, years or put it back? As I know, like uh, Ollie was kind of concerned, we have a short window of time to uh, use it and procure it. Uh, so once it's in the bank, will it, can it carry over or, uh, or come back, or do we always maximize those the, the amounts we're showing with those th three different firms? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. I can answer the first one, and then I will ask Ali to answer the second because it's more of a financial question um, on budgeting and things like that. But the first question, as far as uh, the amount of money that we have been uh, granted through the legislature in the past for these projects. Uh, this this amount is, is pretty close to what we have been allocated in the past. I think we've had a little bit more, uh, maybe in the, in, the, in the past bienniums, more in line of like $1 million that was split four ways among four proposers, or maybe a little more than that. Um, I don't remember offhand. I can definitely get you the, the true numbers for that because we have them, um, but it's pretty close. It's, it's in line with, with what we've done before. Um, regarding the uh, yeah the, the funds and how that carries over, that's that is something I will defer to my superiors on because it's not something that I work with very much. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Members. Um, thank you, Brian. Um, this this amount of funding is is uh, very close to what we used to get in the past. Uh, actually, this is less. This is the first time we we'll get less uh, um, money at this time because. Um, as you might know, uh, Council Member uh, Sterner, in the last couple of years, the, there was a uh, there was a projection of shortage for clean water fund, and agencies decided to cut back on the money. And then now, all of a sudden, we have a, a surplus of money available in clean water fund. So hopefully, they will make us haul in the next round of funding. Uh, but in the past, that's why we reduced our uh, request for funding, and that's why you see this is this is less than what we have been uh, uh, given in the in the past four contracts. Uh, usually, these contracts are um, uh, are really uh, very helpful for us, and we have been very efficient with using the funding. Um, most of this money we didn't in the in the past ten years since the start of the Clean Water Fund. We are we are among the fewest agencies that we didn't return any money back to the to the state. We have been utilizing all the money, and actually there was a huge demand. Demand, you know, most of the time, will end up that we are we are have to d delay projects for a year or two until we get more funding because we don't receive all the funding that we are requesting from the Clean Water Fund. And so, um, in the past, we didn't return any funding back, and um, um, we have been, uh, I think, efficient in the utilization of the funding in the way that uh, provide the best uh, and the most efficient uh, return on investment to the communities in the metro area. I hope that answers your question. Yes, and then, uh, Chair, could I do a follow-up question? Please. Too? All right, but my follow-up, we have three different firms uh, doing it, so it's my understanding that they each have a little bit different specialty depending on the project that you would go to one versus another one? Is that why we have three and not two and not one kind of thing? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and House members, that is that is the case. We have the, all three firms were judged to be uh, highly qualified for this work, but they all bring some different talents to the table. Um, 
some are a little one or more is a little stronger on technical things and there's another firm that really was uh, impressive in terms of their plan and ideas and experience for outreach and social media which i think we really need to be better at and do more of in our work um so it was yeah that so yes that's that is the case we have some different talents amongst these these firms which is i think is a real asset for us yeah. this time thank you i'm incomplete appreciate it and i was pleased to see that each one will be able to reach our mcub goals of eight percent i think it's tough sometimes for mces to uh reach our goals if we were, for example, buying a particular chemical that's made by only two companies in the nation. Um, but for these types of activities, public outreach, stakeholder engagements, things of that nature, um, we really do have a good MCUB opportunity here. And so I'm, I'm pleased to see that they will be able to reach that goal. Uh, other comments or questions? Seeing none, do we have a motion? Now, this is Stern. I'd make a motion to approve the item. Second. Zero seconds. seconds. I think I hear I Susan take your pick. I say Zarin. <laughs> All righty. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. Fredson. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Vento. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Zarin. Aye. And Lindstrom. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I do believe that takes us to our general manager's report. You've been busy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, want to make sure that we get enough reminders out that next time we meet, we'll, we'll be in person. So the offices are opening the day before. So day two, environment committee in person. So do your best to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just I also want to give a reminder and some upcoming dates. So our budget cycle is going to be starting May 10th. We'll give you a preliminary budget presentation. And then on the 26th, we're going to have our first online virtual customer forum and open house. And Chair Zelli is going to do the intro, or that's the plan at the, at the present. And then on June 7th, we'll do our second one. And Chair Lindstrom is going to do our intro for that one. And we'll be back to share our feedback that we obtained in both of those sessions uh, at our July 12th meeting and seek your approval for the rates and charges that we um, have developed. And then on the 27th, the council would be approving those rates and changes. And that should be pretty consistent with what you've been uh, experienced in previous years when we've budget done our budget cycle. So, just to let you know, it's about to start. And you uh, published the 2021 performance report uh, not too long ago. So I encourage everybody to check that out. A yep. challenging year, but a good year. And a one that um, makes it pretty clear that all hands were on deck to strive for continuous improvement. Well, 2021 was a, another exceptional year from the standpoint of what we accomplished despite all the disruptive things that we we're still dealing with with the pandemic. But we had every plant, every facility had perfect compliance in 2021. So our record, you know, has been upheld by a lot of dedicated, hardworking and committed employees. So grateful for that. As are we. Without anything else, oh, Council Member Vento. Mr. Chair, um, and Mr. Chair and Lisa, if I could, I'm wondering if at some time it might be appropriate for us as a committee or possibly even at a committee of the whole session, I don't know that it, 
necessarily requires that, but to have a, a presentation regarding the water level issue in White Bear, I know it's limited to my district. Well, it, it initiates in my district, but the impact could reach beyond my district significantly. And um, it, it may not be, it, it may be an issue that others are either gonna get questions about and or have an interest in. Um, and I know that it doesn't directly affect us, but I'm already getting questions about what we, the Met Council are gonna do about it. And right now, you know, the big question is the whole litigation piece between the DNR and, and White Bear. So um, th that's one request. The, the other is I made the mistake late last night of reading an article, I believe it was in the New York Times, regarding PFAS in Maine and the impact it's having on farmers in Maine. Um, and you know, our, our focus on PFAS here in, in the metro area has been in areas um, impacted by the disposal of products with PFAS in them here in the East metro area. But I'm curious as to whether or not there's been much investigation into um, the broader risks of PFAS elsewhere here in the metro area and in Minnesota. I know that military bases show up um, and I think there's one other site that I've seen, there was an interactive map in the article and they showed uh, military sites and I think there was a third category, but now I can't remember it. But um, it just, I, I continue to be concerned about the PFAS and what we don't know, we don't know about them and how we can keep our eyes and ears open to if not be ahead of it, to at least be closely following behind. Thank you. Very good, Mr. Chair and uh, Council Member Vento. I will consult with staff in terms of what kind of an info item we'd be able to bring forward on White Bear Lake, lake level. Um, that isn't so directly uh, related to us because we're not the regulator, it's the DNR piece, but we are very much trying to um, bring ourselves to any kind of process support that we can do to help solutions be found with the parties that are affected by this. So we're um, doing uh, a lot of thoughtful consideration about how we can support the challenges that the DNR and the communities that are affected by the decision of the court on that litigation. Uh, the PFAS, uh, PCA has just published um, their plan for doing more um, testing and uh, we might be able to bring more information on that I'll see if um, maybe even PCA would be willing to provide someone to give an overview of that. I know resources are, resources are pretty stretched thin is my understanding. So we, we may just have to ask for their permission to do an overview of what we've got as a report, but we'll, we'll try and get you something in response to your request. Thank That'd you. be outstanding on both of those items. I know I, I presented to the city of Circle Pines maybe a month and a half ago or so, and they asked me about White Bear Lake and, and the water level there, about our involvement with that. And I did, did not have a very satisfactory answer. I said, I'm sure our water planning, water supply folks are involved in some capacity, but uh, I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure, uh, so that would be, That'd be good because you're right, Council Member Vento. Um, at least I'm I'm being asked about that. Um, and well, and yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, and I know that that uh, Council Member um, uh, Gonzalez, I'm sure, is getting questions about it too because of Matamida and Delwood and and um, Grant and all of that area. So we'll talk to. Um, Judd and Brooke, because um, it may very well be the right thing to bring up as an update to the council as a whole. Um, again, we'll we'll follow up on that and see what we can come up with. And I'm curious to know what's happening on the national level too with proposed legislation uh, and how that's all playing out. Um, and I know that. Uh, Lots of people are paying attention to this issue across the region. Um, 
and uh, we we may have a presentation by a, a high school student who won a uh, or at least one honorable mention on a, a project PFAS related project uh, uh, just recently. Um, we're looking into possibly having her produce her findings to this group. And in tell the, us in the weeks or months ahead. Yeah, go Mr. ahead. Chair, tell us why you know about this. Uh, I know about this young, uh, impressive person who lives in Eden Prairie because she was a student of my sister, who is a teacher. And Council Member Vento, how, why are you asking me that question? <laughs> Well, because I know you're related to Ms. Dayton. <laughs> I am indeed. Now, how do you know Ms. Dayton, my sister? She was a third grader of mine many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> but remember, I started teaching when I was, you know, about 10. <laughs> do you like it how we ask questions where we already know the answer? <laughs> uh, that's true. Yep. Yep. This young person is a, was a student of my sister's and my sister was a student of Councilmember Vento. Just a few years ago. If if you have time, I'd encourage you to read the New York Times article. And if you want me to send it to you, I'd be happy to. It Don't read it late at night, though, because you're going to find it hard to sleep. It mm. focuses on a young couple who started an organic farm. And it, it talks about how they're moving from being farmers to organic farmers to environmental advocates and it's 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 heartbreaking because they were really putting their heart and soul and all of their their financial resources into this farm and they're done for now at least with farming so i'd encourage you to read it and it's a good thing we have we have students coming coming along like the one that we hopefully will get to hear from from eden prairie because we need that kind of vision no doubt about it uh, yeah, I'll definitely check out that article. And anything else? All right. We'll see you all in person <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Goodbye, awesome. everyone. Thanks a lot. Have a great afternoon. I know. Oh, wait, I have to thank some people. <laughs> oh, too late. Too late.